They call me Morpheus. They are afraid of me. They are afraid of me because I am asking disruptive questions and I seek answers they don't want you to know. I bet many of you came to uh, and followed the white rabbit here this morning to this conference because you have questions just like mine. You wake up in the morning restless. You feel that you are overwhelmed yet under challenged. There are hundreds of emails waiting for you. There are tasks every day repeating the same way. When was the last time you were really excited? Your creativity really challenged. The system boxed you in. The system crushed your individuality. Well, today I am here to give you a choice. Reach under your seat and you will find a personalized envelope. Every one of you, reach under your seat. See, it is right there. What you will find is an envelope. In this envelope, there is a blue pill and a red pill. If you take the red pill, I guarantee you, you wake up tomorrow morning and you will not even remember this talk took place. But if you take the red pill, I open the door for you and show you a beautiful new nano revolution taking place right now and where it requires every one of your individuality, unique, special contribution. The choice is yours. Those of you who took the red pill, follow me. This is the outline of my talk. Um, if the pill didn't kick in just yet and you don't read uh, Matrix fluently, let me elaborate. Uh, I will be talking about how the system came to be. The system came to be on the back of the computer age. The computer age definitely was a tremendous success. We get to watch cool movies on the iPhone and uh, we get to play Master Chief on our Xbox. <laughs> the secret of the success, however, we have to understand is that everything was built on one standard paradigm, the transistor. Starting from a humble beginnings, uh, in a half century we figured out how to uh, smoosh billions and billions of transistors on a single chip. The system was extremely successful. However, it comes at a price. The system built on a single standard paradigm lives on standard solutions. It smooshes millions of transistors in an ordered array, just like it smooshes people in ordered arrays of cubicle, depriving you from your creativity. Moreover, the expansion of the system is slowing down. Moore's law, which is uh, predicting an exponential growth of the transistor density and performance, very clearly is slowing down, even according to Moore himself. Well, the thesis of my talk is this. The computer age was built on a single standardized paradigm. It, came, it gave us great steady progress and the economic benefit of scaling makes it all cheap and available. At the same time, the standard solutions, uh, this uh, standardized system asked for standardized solutions instead of disruptive, unique ones asking for your own creativity. Uh, and moreover, the explosive growth is nearing its end, so it is now for us to try to think very differently and propose very different paradigms. Well, this is what leads us to the nano age, where instead of following a single paradigm, there are myriads of invented small ideas explored. Uh, there isn't a single paradigm, a single steam engine pushing it forward. There are no benefits of scaling yet. However, the nano age invites your unique, creative, disruptive solutions and can break through many of the limits the transistors are reaching in these days. So uh, with this, uh, I would like to uh, invite you that to explore with me four specific areas where nano solutions offer tremendous hope uh, to uh, give us answers about energy problems, make genuinely new types of computers, uh, and have really, really promising medical applications. First of all, energy. I don't have to show you just how important energy, but I will uh, do so nevertheless. There is a tremendous amount of increase in energy demand, and there is a gap opening between the production and the demand of energies, which is uh, estimated to be going from 14 to more than 30,000 gigawatt by the end of the century. How to put it into context, ladies and gentlemen, between today and the end of our century, every single day, 
A one gigawatt new power plant has to be implemented somewhere on Earth every single day for the rest of the century. Absolutely staggering. And moreover, uh, the, uh, the environmental concerns are horrible uh, and uh, um, the impact and the global warming is also tremendously challenging. Oil is running out and uh, it cannot serve us much longer. In fact, we cannot just go to the uh, telephone and say, Tang, I need an exit from the energy solution. <laughs> Nobody is answering. We have to solve this problem ourselves. The only available uh, energy source which is in sufficient qualities, uh, quantities is solar energy. So the first thing I will tell you about is how to harvest solar energy in new daring ways. Well, every single solar cell uh, manufactured on Earth until today is built on the following paradigm, one photon in, one electron out. What does this mean? Here is the sun. You know how hard it is for, to find the green sun, but I found it. Uh, <laughs> here is the sun emitting <laughs> photons, and I am matching it with the green atom. Watch that. Uh, and uh, that photon is absorbed by an electron of the atom. It gets excited, holds all the solar energy. But before we can get to it and extract it for our own purposes, such as running our iPod, uh, it uh, ex experiences a tremendous loss of energy and we get to take out only a small fraction of the solar energy. How little it is, you ask? Well, the theoretical maximum is only 31% and in reality, our efficiencies are 10 to 20%. It is absolutely pitiful. To put it uh, differently, 80 to 90% of the solar energy which is incident on today's solar cells gets, goes to waste. 80 to 90 percent we lose. It is perfectly clear, it is time to look for a new paradigm. One paradigm proposed a couple of decades ago, uh, comes from National Ren Renewable Energy Laboratory, which says, how about for every coming, uh, photon coming in, let's try to make many electrons. Sounds great, how do you do that? Here is your excited electron, and when it decides to give away its energy, instead of heating the solar cell, uh, maybe it can zap uh, another electron through a strong interaction and excite that guy too. And now, no energy was lost and we are extracting more, a larger part of the solar energy by this mechanism. What we really need, however, is uh, a very strong interaction between electrons. Well, uh, uh, a few years ago, a group in Los Alamos uh, proposed that if uh, we uh, make so uh, solar cells from nanoparticles, then in fact the electrons will be so closely smooshed together that their interaction will be stronger than anything before. And in fact, uh, they uh, backed up their uh, proposition with experiments, and this is the energy of photons, and this is the number, of, essentially the number of electrons coming out per photon. You can see this number goes up to seven. These people were able to break a paradigm of one photon in, one, photon out, one electron out, all the way producing to seven electrons. I am very uh, happy to report that there is a group also here in Davis and in uh, Santa Cruz who is also uh, trying to build nanoparticle solar cells and our initial results uh, are, uh, really hold a certain promise. Uh, why? Because certainly the previous theoretical limit has been broken and we are really trying to touch just how far out we can go. This is not the only way to use nanostructures uh, to improve our uh, uh, solar cell efficiency. This is, a, this is a very daring group from Harvard who took a normal old solar cell and they blasted it with femtosecond laser pulses in a dense pattern. They really created like this Bryce Canyon, nano Bryce Canyon if you will. And here is how the solar cell absorbed energy before and after the treatment. Notice for some of the wavelengths it's like half of the energy absorbed, in other wavelengths just about none. After they created this nanostructure, look what happens. Through the entire wavelength range, uh, the absorption goes close to one. Again, a tremendous uh, promise that just how well we can capture solar cells. Here is another paradigm breaking idea. Uh, it, it, this is coming uh, from Boston to us. Uh, they say, uh, let's formulate our problem in terms of terminology what is called the thick, thin problem. A normal solar cell has a silicon layer which absorbs uh, the light. Well, silicon is expensive and price is important. So you may, be, you may feel compelled to make the layer thinner. That is very good, reduces the price. However, then 
photons start to leak through your layer and your efficiency goes down. So that is what is called the thick thin problem. What they said is that, hey, how about the following? Let's take the light and not uh, invite it to go through it, but how about making the light go parallel to the silicon? How unique that is. Hey, wait a minute. How will I convince the light to do that, okay? And they said, well, I have seen one creative idea. For example, the coax cable, which is bringing internet to every one of your homes, is in fact guiding electromagnetic wave very, 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 very efficiently. So they said, let's build nano-sized coax cables. Look at this, these are little pins. On the outside of the pins, there are coax cables, just like the ones which bring the internet into your room. And when the light is coming in, they will start guiding it coming down. And then they have to coat it with only a very, very thin silicon layer. And since the light is going parallel to the silicon, it absorbs it much more efficiently. Just think about it, how unique, creative these ideas are, and how far out the box these guys were thinking. Here is the second uh, uh, area I wanted to touch, uh, uh, using nanostructures for redefining computer architectures to mimic the brain. If you look around yourself, uh, you will notice there are two really good calculators around the world. One, of the one is a laptop with a processor and the memory, and here is the brain. Uh, their architectures are profoundly different. The question is eminently reasonable. Uh, can we learn something uh, from the brain architecture and put it to good use to make better, faster, uniquely different computers. I wouldn't say it if it weren't true. Uh, the basic building blocks of computers are transistors for the brain is a neuron. One of their basic functions is switching. Both of them do. The transistors do yes or no, and the neurons are firing when you stimulate them. Uh, another basic function is memory, and uh, neurons do remember. Oops. Transistors don't. A key difference between the uh, basic Legos or building blocks of the system is our transistors don't remember. And in fact, this is exactly why modern computers spend like more than 70% of its time, computational time, by shuffling data between that processor and that memory, which I mentioned in the beginning. A tremendous loss. Well, can we think of a new paradigm-breaking way of solving this problem? And here it is. Uh, a group a couple of years ago at Hewlett Packard, he said, hey, how about making transistors with memory? Uh, this is too many syllables. Let's call them memory stores. They are building memory stores, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and uh, the memory stores are a tiny little innocent looking platinum titanium oxide device. Uh, it, there is a low current state. If you put around one volt, it switches to the high current state and it re remains so. Uh, you go uh, on vacation, you come back, and uh, the system is still in that state where you left it, okay? Uh, remarkably, again, uh, what is actually doing the switching is oxygen atoms moving as little as a half nanometer, a true exploitation of nanostructures of, uh, uh, in a revolutionary manner. Well, uh, so what can we do with that? Uh, lots and lots of things. Here is, for example, a patent that we can totally rethink the basic design of our computers to do away with the processor and separated memories. We can have distributed processing the data where the data is stored without shuffling it back and forth. We can build smart memories uh, which can replace today's hard drives and flash. And it will be genuinely different. And finally, we are not just serving the computer industry, we are totally redefining it. Uh, there is one more thing which I really like. Uh, this is a memory store in action. Uh, this little pass is where the uh, tunneling or the conduction takes place. And look what happens. If you cut it here, it actually decides to reform itself on the side, as if it were alive. That's creepy. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the third is uh, nanosensors for cancer. A few years ago, many of us got really excited when a California laboratory mentioned that dogs can smell cancer. Shocking news. In fact, uh, in biopsy-confirmed cancer patients, the dogs could figure out who has cancer with a 99% accuracy. Amazing result. Uh, which brings us to the question, how come? How come that dogs can smell it? And the answer is that uh, uh, dogs have a often 100,000 times better, stronger sense of scent than we humans. So uh, different groups are now taking on themselves to make artificial noses. 
or as Steve Jobs would like to call it, the eye noses. Uh, <laughs> uh, they can be uh, made of nanoparticles or uh, nanorods over here, and they managed uh, to put them into an integrated circuit. And here you can see that whenever they sent in, in ppms, parts per million, tiny, tiny concentration, these various gases, uh, these electrodes produced a huge response. These people managed to get a tremendously efficient artificial nose. Finally, uh, one of my favorites, nanostructures for restoring vision. Uh, a few events can be more traumatic uh, than a loss of sight. And, um, uh, however, a group of uh, UC Santa Cruz researchers are having a program uh, to build an artificial retina. What do these people do? Uh, if your retina failed, then they say, hey, wait a minute, I just break my iPhone open and put that little uh, CCD camera into the bottom of your retina. And in fact, if I manage to send light and then send the electric signals towards the brain, there's a chance that your vision will be restored. Remarkable uh, well, how many obstacles these people have to overcome, though. Uh, for example, where do you put the battery? It's kind of uh, problematic to ha have a little battery standing out uh, on the side of the eyeball. Where do you stick it? And the answer is, look how creative these people are. They said, let's put, and I'm not making this up, let's put solar cells on the bottom of your eyeball around the CCD camera. And so every time uh, power will be there when you need it, when you open your eye to see. Now, this is revolutionary. And here is uh, another group which is showing to us how to make connections between neurons and uh, electric systems. These are nanotubes, and you can very clearly see how they could actually uh, convince uh, individual neurons to grow into these nanotubes to which then you can uh, form a uh, very good connection. So these were four examples which showed that the nanorevolution nano is really exciting and ask you to, be, to provide a very unique, different uh, contribution. Now, I don't have a doubt uh, that uh, the progress will be uh, meeting obstacles and sometimes we have to dodge bullets like that. However, at the same time, I'm fully confident that we can eventually stop all of those challenges, investigate what is thrown at us, throw it away, and overcome. The nanorevolution will prevail. The only remaining question is, how much do you want to explore it or possibly join it? The choice is yours.